This is 93.5 CHMR-FM. Welcome to Rustling Pages. I'm Chris Russell. And I'm Max Page. Thank you for joining us this evening. Yeah, uh, so tonight we've got the three, the final three executive for next year, the Munsu executive. we got Ryan Murphy, Kim Drizdle, and uh, Sean Kennedy in the house. But, Thanks uh, for coming, guys. Yeah, but first, what are we are we doing the video first or the talking about the election first? Well, we ran into Sheila O'Leary tonight at Marie's down in Churchill Square. Yeah, and she it, wanted us to talk about the election. And she uh, provoked us to talk about the election a little bit. The uh, Virginia Botters by-election, that is, for anyone uh, who doesn't know what we're talking about. And so we were going to uh, maybe do a, a couple little plugs here. Uh, it's interesting because uh, I have worked with Sheila this, uh, this election and... Um, yeah, and I've worked. Uh, I've been working, putting up signs and uh, making phone calls for Danny Breen, the PC candidate. Yeah, and uh, so we just want to do a little shout out, just to make sure people know that it's going on, particularly Memorial University students. Oh, if you out there listening to us right now, uh, I decided to help Sheila out. I followed her when I got back from when I got back to Newfoundland uh, from Halifax over the summer. I was very interested in what Sheila had to say during the municipal elections. I followed her a little bit. I also saw her at the David Suzuki's uh, talk in on Gower Street, at the church on Gower Street, where she had a lot of great things to say, things that really resonate with me, and it provoked me to go and help her out a little bit. Yeah, uh, okay, uh, cool. Um, yeah, and I was, like I said, I was putting up signs for Danny Breen last weekend. Uh, got to meet Danny Williams. That was really cool. Um, it's no secret that I'm kind of... Uh, pro the the more right side of the spectrum. I've been a member of the PC party since I was like 16 years old, so I'm finally starting to do a little bit of work for for a candidate, and it's been a, a good learning experience, I guess. Um, well, not I guess it it's true. Yeah, and I I, I mean the thing I value about it the most is uh, how kind of accessible and available Sheila was uh, for new faces like myself, she herself and her whole campaign team were uh, very um, nice and approachable and inviting, and they made me feel valued and stuff like that. And I think that goes to say with like kind of just Newfoundland politics in general, it seems like very accessible. Yeah, well, um, I mean, I just got an email that said uh, uh, last week one time I got an email that just basically said, you know, if you want to help out, come to Danny Breen headquarters Saturday at 10 in the morning. Uh, and I walked in and, you know, Danny Breen was there and he greeted me and he was super welcoming and was just like, you know, this is what we're doing today. This is what we're looking at. This is what I think. Uh, and it was great. And I just everyone's just really welcoming. They're definitely looking for youth to get involved. Uh, so if you feel that you're down with uh, fiscal responsibility, uh, the PC party would love your help. <laughs> Sorry. And uh, I think all uh, uh, those of us out there who are uh, politically engaged, keep at it. Um, Sheila's campaign was really uh, approachable. It sounds like Danny's was too. And there's also a, a third party involved, the Liberals and Kathy Bennett. So everybody in that district, everybody running for these elections, uh, good luck. Just doing a little shout out to you guys. Yeah, the election, for anyone who's in that district, the election is uh, next Wednesday from 8 a.m. to 9 p.m. or 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. And there's a lot of people out there facilitating uh, getting people out to vote too. So make sure that you contact the appropriate person. Um, so we're going to do our third installment now of the uh, Occupy the Arts Building. Uh, it's a dramatic reading done by myself. I grabbed, got my hands on an old cap and gown that described a story about the student um, kind of uprising and student reform in the 70s. So I'm going to play this uh, now once we get everything on the go. Um, so sit back, relax, and enjoy. I'm back. I, uh, I'm here with the, I guess the next, the third, the third installment of my dramatic reading depiction of the student protests of 1973. Um, where we left off last time was the support and the formation of um, how uh, 
the logistics kind of went throughout the protests. And we also saw that there was a lot of support coming from ex outside external organizations. So, time for part three of Occupation from the Outside by Ian Wiseman in the 1973 Cap and Gown. So the students in the building, cheering enthusiastically every time a letter of support was read from the speaker's podium, were in rare spirits as the third day dawned. Classes had resumed in the building and there was little doubt now that the occupation would last indefinitely until the administration broke down. Bolstered by external support they were receiving and by the fact that student societies were all, except the engineers, now backing them. The demonstrators spent much of the day arguing over the wording of a referendum to be held on the issue of self-determination of the student union and its fee structures. The final, decision, the final selection of words, carefully dealing with only the philosophical issue of self-determination and not with the occupation itself, was done by a small group of students who drew up the resolution and then ramrodded it through a tired meeting. Friday was a day of waiting. A special edition of the Muse, produced from temporary offices within the administration building, appeared on campus, explaining clearly to all students that the only issue in question was the student rights to control their own union. Students voted all day in the referendum, which was administered by the graduate student union, which had been spared by Taylor as their affairs were in good order. As voting continued throughout the day, students began to get the first indications that they were not alone in their opposition to the president. The executive of the faculty association had a secret meeting in which they called a general meeting of all members for Monday to discuss the student issue. Several key administrators, impatient with Taylor's handling of the situation, let it be known that there was a serious rift developing in the upper administrative echelons. The referendum results were as expected. Final statistics showed that 92% of those voting at opposed Taylor's stand. The turnout for the vote? 60% of the student body was a high percentage as ever voted in a student ballot. The president's argument that demonstration was only supported by the lunatic fringe was shattered. But what to do on the weekend? Taylor remained inflexible and ignorant of the vote and ignored the vote, calling the referendum tactics reminiscent of Hitler at its silliest. They elected to, pay, to play wait and see during the weekend until Monday when the faculty members made their decision. The next step, whichever, was, whichever way the professors leaned, would be to go over Taylor's head, providing he had not backed down by then. The only group above the president students only knew too well was the provincial government. The weekend turned into a time of mental and physical strain for all. The entertainment and food people were working above and beyond the call of duty trying to keep the health and sanity in the building. The Food Services Committee would cook over $1,000 worth of food before the occupation ended. But the general mood could hardly be kept above one of melancholy. There were scattered flashes of hysteria and paranoia. The students would be alternate between the fear that they were being manipulated and the fear that the police were coming. Totally unrealistic at that stage. The short-lived party mood on Friday night dis dis dissipated fast. There were a few general meetings called, but the Little Theatre became a center for film and musical entertainment on Saturday and Sunday. Two important events happened this weekend. The first was a seminar in the administration building at which a score of professors spoke on the governing structures at Memorial and gave unequivocal support to the occupation. The other was a press release from the Board of Regents claiming that unanimous support of that body from Taylor's actions. The latter was a false statement, considering that a couple of regents were out of town and not contacted, while well, at least one other supported the principle of the student demands. The demonstration began to become reorganized, and Monday, as people came back to the campus for classes and reinforced the ranking of their occupiers, whose numbers at one point during the week had dropped to 40. The internal pressure groups met and formed strategic committees to coordinate tactical activities in order to avoid directional confusion. The strategic committee was composed of four student negotiators plus three elected members from the student present. This group, the most powerful body in the days to come, was invaluable since its creation diminished manipulation by individual whim and channeled people's creative energies in a single direction. Outside the building, other activities related to the demonstration were taking their course. A move that Taylor had made six months previously had backfired on him. During the summer, he had unilaterally fired the curator of the Arts Gallery at the Arts and Culture Center and assumed the position himself. Monday's papers carried the news of the Atlantic Province's art cir circuit had suspended Memorial as a member because of Taylor's actions. This meant that, the most, that most major art exhibits and artists would boycott the University Gallery until Taylor re relinquished his self-appointed role as curator. It also meant a likely loss of government money for the gallery 
as well as being a serious blow to Taylor's personal credibility. Now we see the tides turning. I have one more installment of this, where we begin to speak about, um, I think residence is mentioned a little bit more, and the final formation of the uh, movement. So thanks again for listening to part three, and part four is coming your way now. Thank you very much. See you soon. Max Page. Go ahead, Kitty. Go outside. Outside? What are you, crazy? It's a dog-eat-cat world out there. Ah, please, not outside. I could get hit by a car. Pick up some disease. Get chased by the neighbor. Be rained and snowed on. It's a jungle out there. I'm staying inside where I'll be happy, healthy, and live three times longer than an outdoor cat. Do you know where your cat is? For more information on keeping cats happy and safe indoors, call your local animal shelter or the Canadian Federation of Humane Societies. Hello, it's Alan Doyle. You're listening to CHMR 93.5. What a station. And we're back. So we're here talking to the incoming executive director of Student Life on the Munsu Board of Directors for next year. Uh, her name's Kim Drizdel, for anyone who doesn't know her. Uh, me and Kim lived in res together our first year. Uh, it was awesome. She's from uh, Dirty Dartmouth, Nova Scotia, uh, the worst. Uh, she's been on the Munsu Board for four years. She was female res rep, and then she served three years as director at large. Uh, she has been a memorial ambassador, worked at the Office of Student Recu uh, Recruitment, uh, volunteer at the Women's Resource Center. She was the Winter Carnival Coordinator a couple of years back. Super, super involved in residence back in the day. I mean, I'm pretty sure she was uh, elected female res rep like partway through our frost year. Uh, psychology major with an anthropology minor, and she has a certificate in criminology. So, Kim, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Chris. Thanks yes. for coming. So, first of all, congratulations on well snatching uh, up the executive be, be, student being life. Being this position next year, <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say winning, but uh, how how, uh, how do you feel about it? Are you pumped up or what? I'm so excited. Absolutely, this is something that I've really been looking forward to and looking forward to running for for the last couple of years. I saw it and I knew I wanted it, so I'm really happy to uh, finally be in it. Yeah, before nice. before we get too much into the intricacies of the position, uh, let's talk about res for a bit. Like, yeah. that's kind of where you came from, right? Oh yeah. Uh, as as did I. Um, what was your favorite part about residence? Uh, do you feel like it helped you at all, kind of f pursue this role or anything like that? Or? Oh my gosh, absolutely. Residence life was amazing. I mean, you know, I, I moved out of residence three years ago. I was there five years ago in my first year, and to this day, it is still everybody I hang out with, and all my roommates, and all my closest friends came from residence. I was a lonely old. Dartmouth kid. I think I came here with one friend and, and now I have definitely more than one. Um, <laughs> and yeah, you know, uh, residence is great because you're living on campus, so you kind of are automatically engaged with what's going on. So so I knew a little bit about Munsu and I had somebody uh, who I knew from residence encourage me to apply to the position. Cool, cool. So um, what, uh, how is it the exact, like, tell the little story sort of of how you got into into Munsu so early, like with the female res rep position in that by-election, that's when it was, right? Yep. Yeah. yeah, so it was actually my, I believe it was my senior year, yeah, it was a by-election, so it happened halfway through the year. Um, there was an individual who had seen, I knew him from residence, and he saw a poster up on the wall, and he knew that I was really involved in my student council back in high school, we went to the same high school, and he called me up and said, hey, I saw this, you know, you might be interested in it. So I went online, went on the website, looked at it a little bit, went into the office and talked to a couple people about it and was encouraged to to try out for it and yeah I ended up getting acclaimed my first year there's nobody else that ran for the position and it, I've just been in love ever since I guess yeah that's the perfect history uh, yeah. So, yeah I actually met Kim uh, at a party at Chris Russell's house in Bedford uh, <laughs> it was a week before I came to Munn and yourself Haley and Katie were the first people that I met at Munn mm -hmm. so Kim and I go way back uh, we've you know partied and socialized like we got to know each other on a kind of a deep political level uh, before we got into the whole Muncie thing. And Kim, we were going to put a couple of pictures of you up on oh, Facebook, no. um, but we want to make sure you're okay with them first. Kim and I, this was a couple of years back, uh, Kim got her hands on my cell phone and took a bunch of selfies of herself, and we took a bunch of pictures with uh, Marie Hogan as well. So Kim, <laughs> can we look at these pictures really quickly to make sure that we can get them up on Facebook? Uh, this is the first one. Uh, we mm -hmm. got a little bit of you dancing around with Marie. Marie <laughs> looks a little crazy. Uh, 
What about this one here, Ken? This one looks a little offensive. What were you thinking about this one? <laughs> Do you, uh, where'd you get that headband? <laughs> that's, I think that's your headband. Oh, yeah. We had, we had matching red headbands yeah, for a while yeah, there. For like, okay. <laughs> I think that's yours. So I think I just stole that from you. I think I still have that. Uh, we got this one here. Um, I don't know what oh, my God. <laughs> This one's definitely going on Facebook. I didn't know that my face could do that. <laughs> that one, I, I mean, don't know. That one's my favorite. I was a little. Maybe I, it looks like I might have snatched the phone away from you right before you ate it in this picture. <laughs> yeah, I have a thing. <laughs> I don't know what you're looking at in this one. Oh yes, yes, yes. Yeah, that's my uh, that's my typical face. When I wonder I where everyone else was when you were doing this. I don't know because I seem to be totally alone, just taking taking pictures of. <laughs> And then we got, uh, this This one's impressive. This is a good one over here. Like, yeah, yeah, guys, uh, uh, audience react, crowd reaction on this one. Uh, and, uh, how long have you had these? Uh, well, like, literally <laughs> is it weird you? that I've had them for like two years <laughs> yeah. and I didn't tell you? <laughs> bit, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm the weirdo in this situation. It's kind of weird that they're on your computer and not just on your phone, too. Yeah, I think I must have like <laughs> imported them and then deleted them off my phone. Oh, and my I just gosh. knew there was going to be a golden time to have it. And then this is the three of us. I think uh, is that you, me, and Marie? You kind of look like you're doing like a little like kind of like dance. soldier boy. Listen, I'm a fun dance. person. Okay, so we uh, soldier boy. <laughs> so we're gonna put all these on Facebook right away. Yeah, yes, and <laughs> we'll talk about it after. Maybe we'll, maybe we'll maybe a little selective with it. Oh my gosh! <laughs> I can't uh, wait. I can't. So for those of you at home, uh, <laughs> check check it out. <laughs> I can't believe you've had those on your computer for two years. I, yeah, that's weird. You I'm just right. knew that this day would come. <laughs> Be able to pull it out on you. Uh, okay, so, right, so let's get back to, to <laughs> let's get back let's get back to questions. So why uh, why student life, Kim? Why did you pick that position? Out Obviously, I'm fond of going to those pictures. Um, <laughs> I've I've just been really been engaged in in student life. Like I mentioned, you know, I was when our carnival coordinator. I stayed super engaged with residents even after I moved out. Um, you know, I've I've done stuff with Oxfam, which is a club on campus. I was involved in the resident society. I'm a volunteer with the Women's Resource Center. Um, sort of everything in my uh, extracurricular path has sort of led to student life, and it's something that I I'm invested in and I'm passionate about, and I really want to show incoming students, you know, what there is at Memorial and what we can create for them, just like and give them the experience that I had myself. Yeah, you got your feet wet for sure. Definitely. <laughs> So what do you plan on bringing to the table? What's <laughs> going to be the, what's going to be like kind of the, uh, like maybe, uh, yeah, your experiences in the past. What do you think is going to really give you like an angle or like an advantage or with the student life position? What are you like, looking for? You know to? what? I think I'm just, I'm not, a, I'm not afraid to change things. You know, there, there are some things in student life and in all the positions that have been the same for years and years and years. And when we ask about them, we're always told, oh, well, that's the way it's always been. And, you know, I don't think that that's, that's a good enough answer. I think that things do need to change. You know, I think that we need to go out, we need to talk to students, and we need to try some new things out, try some new events out at the Breezeway. You know, um, maybe do some stuff to the Breezeway or, or try some new promotion techniques with the Breezeway. Um, talk to clubs and societies and resource centers more. And one thing that I'm really passionate about is the biggest complaint that we seem to hear is that we focus a lot on resident students and while that's that is very true because resident students are the ones that seem to be most um most engaged and most invested in in the university um definitely have to uh encourage everyone else to uh to stay involved as well everyone in town and everyone who doesn't live there um yeah, yeah. All right, cool. So, um, what about uh, what about your committee next year? Like, what do you want to work on with the student life committee that you? Or maybe must explain run? the nature of what the student life committee is. And mm. yeah, so uh, the student life committee um, is a committee that I chair and is composed of members from or the student body. Um, we focus around three main things. We focus around funding for students and student groups. Um, events, so things that you know happen at Winter Carnival, events that we put on at the Breezeway, and that sort of thing, as well as club societies and resource centers. And so, uh, the goals of the committee in the coming year? Do you have anything um, lined out? I mean, some some would say that the committees are kind of deter, or the goals of the committee are determined by the members. Mm -hmm. uh, but what do you want to uh, see being fulfilled with that committee? Uh, my main thing for the committee is I want people who are not just part of the board on the committee. I want to engage other students um, in our membership as well to, to come and have their say in the committee as well. Um, and I want them to feel welcome and I want their say to be heard and to know that I'm listening. Um, 
that's that's sort of the main thing and then take it from there see what people want um and and you know plan events and and talk about everything and make sure that whatever you know i'm looking at doing i'm making sure that i'm informing everybody on the board and everybody's sort of on the committee as well so we can all work together on it cool excellent super uh super interesting kim so what uh now i know that one of your summer jobs back in the day you were doing something with events but for anyone who doesn't know since events event planning is such a big part of your job next year uh, do you want to talk a little bit about your experience in that uh, sphere? Yeah, yeah, totally. So I actually, uh, when I was living back in uh, Dartmouth, Nova Scotia, I worked for a company, a small business in Halifax for two years, um, and it was mainly an events planning and promotions uh, company, um, and we serviced sort of the entire the entire East Coast. So I did a lot of like weekend trips and that sort of thing. Um, and I also worked, it was really great because the first summer I got to sort of be on site and um, help out with that. And then the second summer I did a lot of the logistics, um, a lot of the behind the scenes, um, you know, working with the trucks and, and working with the staffing and that sort of thing. So I saw, it, saw all angles of it and I definitely think that that's going to help me in the, in the position to come. Uh, so that's one big part of the committee, the events, yeah. stuff like that. Uh, I'm going to move just really quickly into the funding aspect that you mentioned earlier. I'm curious about uh, what the funding's for uh, and how people apply for it and, and if there's different kinds of funding. And stuff yeah, like totally. That. Um, so we offer four basic funding opportunities. Um, the first one is the Individual Merit Fund. Um, it's for individual students to apply who need extra funding um, with events or things that they're going to relating to their academics or extracurricular activities. Um, the second one is the Special Project Grant, also known as SPG. Um, it's for student groups who are taking on sort of major initiatives that need extra funding. Uh, the third one is a more recent one from the Students Union Student, right in Action, student Rights in Action Committee, excuse me. Um, and it's more surrounding social innovation. It's, it's more of a structured grant as well. Um, it's called the Impact Award. And the fourth one is the Conference Hosting Grant, which is for student groups hosting conferences. All of these require applications. They can be found online at munsu.ca. Um, you can come into our office in the UC and talk to somebody there. Um, and if it's you know May 1st or onward when I'll be in office, you're more than welcome to come chat with me um, if you think that you'd like to look at some funding opportunities or you think you want to uh, see if you qualify for some funding, and I'll, I'll help you out there. And if not, you can talk to Dan Campbell, who's the current Executive Director of Student Life. All right, cool. Uh, now we're just going to try to quickly bang out a couple more questions before yep. we have to go to break. So. Uh, not necessarily the most important, but definitely one of the most public and prevalent issues right now. What are some of your plans for the Breezeway next year? That's uh, that's a big topic of discussion, I think. Absolutely. Uh, we need to get the Breezeway back on track, and that's that's all there is to it. I need to seriously start to implement some of um, some changes. Um, we put out a survey last year. Um, I have that survey now, and I've seen a lot of things that people want that we don't have in the breezeway. So we need to bring some new things in, whether that bring, means bring more taps in, bringing more selection. But not only that, to advertise, um, we need to make sure that we're bringing a new promotion strategy to the table um, and so that people know what's going on in the breezeway um, and keeping people updated with the breezeway, as well as we're rolling out a whole new event schedule this year. So. Um, We'll be we'll be bringing in some new events, bringing back some old events, and you know making sure that everything is promoted and advertised so people know what's going on, as well as listening to the student body going around making my voice heard. Absolutely. So, it, to those of you out there, the, it's going to be a very contributory contributory process by the sounds of it, and I'm yeah. sure you can get in touch with Kim if you have any kind of recommendations. Uh, the third aspect of the clubs and or, or the committees are the kind of the clubs and societies, the recognition, ratification, and development, and stuff like that. Yeah. So, can you explain what a club and society is at MUN and how they get started and how the union kind of endorses them? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, clubs and societies. Um, if anybody is interested in a club or society, um, they can come talk to me or uh, currently Dan Campbell on Student Life. Um, they have to go through um, a recognition and then a ratification process where. They'll come in, um, they'll fill out a form, they have to be active for a certain amount of time, um, stay in contact with us um, before they do receive funding. Um, all of these recognitions and ratifications go through the Student Life Committee. Um, and basically, any group can sort of form uh, a club or society, but first, we should probably go talk to the Director of Student Life and we'll, we'll let you know how we can help you and, and that sort of thing. But there's lots of opportunities. And how do you get involved in them? Is there a specific way? What, how, what, how do people typically 
uh, approach a club and society if they haven't been involved in one before? A really great way, actually, to get involved in clubs and societies is the Clubs and Societies Fair that happens during Welcome Weeks every year in September. That's a really great way. Um, usually, uh, we have a calendar that's posted up above the stairs in the UC. Um, you can find them online as well. Um, also, all the clubs and society rooms are on the sixth floor of the University Center if you want to go out there and chat. And um, if not, you can just come in and chat with us in the Munsu office. Tell us what you like, what you want to do, and we'll help you out from there. All right, cool. So we're gonna we got one more question before we go to break. Uh, it's thank a bit you for more, coming. Yeah, thank you. For, oh, well, thanks I mean, for having me, I guys. figure we would have said that at the, at at the, the end. end. <laughs> um, um, so it's a bit more big picture, a bit lighter though. Uh, if you had one piece of advice for first year students coming in about, I guess, how they could get involved, basically what there is for them to do if they're a little lost. Uh, you know, what What would your little bit of advice be to the first year students of next year? Uh, come in and talk to us at the Munsu office. Let us know what you like, what you want to do, and we'll help you out from there. Definitely, though, um, you know, get involved. I wasn't as involved my first year as I wish I could have been. And really step outside your comfort zone. Go talk to people. There'll be lots happening during welcome weeks, during orientation. Go to things. Talk to people. Get numbers. Everybody's there to help you. And, uh, you know, be engaged, and your first year will be amazing. All right, perfect. Well, yeah. uh, thanks a lot for coming on the show, Kim. That was dope. Awesome, Kim. Uh, <laughs> thanks, guys. We're going to go to break now, and when we get back, we'll be talking to Sean Kennedy and then Ryan Murphy, so stay tuned. Listen to 93.5 CHMR FM every Sunday night from 8 to 9 p.m. for completely improvised acts. Who's Got the Mic is the name of the show, and what you'll hear are things completely made up on the spot by our performers. It's sure to be a barrel of laughs. Be sure to check us out on Facebook at www.facebook.com slash who's got the mic. Again, that's every Sunday night, 8 to 9 p.m. Be sure to tune in. Want to learn about living a healthier life? Now is the time. The wellness program brings a healthy lifestyle group brown bag lunch session for employees, students, and alumni. It's happening every Thursday at 12.30 to 1.30 p.m. This announcement has been a public service of 93.5 CHMRFM. Hey, this is Chris Jericho of Fozzie in the Sea Beast of Canada, and you're listening to 93.5 right here. Welcome back to Wrestling Pages with Max Page and Chris Russell. Today we have, or tonight this evening, we have uh, Kim Drizdell, Sean Kennedy, and Ryan Murphy here speaking about Munsu stuff. Uh, and now we have Sean. Sean, uh, Sean Kennedy has been involved with kind of student-related activities since he got here. He started with Engineers Without Borders and is now currently still involved as the president of Engineers Without Borders. He's a director with the Rad Hawk Society. He's been a science rep for two years on the board, uh, volunteers with leadership Societies committees. Uh, he sits on the Senate course evaluations, the uh, university timetable, the faculty of science committee, and the Senate. And he, in the past, has sat on the Senate of undergraduate studies. Uh, he also works with the Board of Regents selections committee and reviews committee of the Dean of Science. Sean, thanks for coming on. Yeah, no thanks, problem. Sean. Uh, Sean, you seem to take on pretty uh, pretty high profile roles. It's, I'm sorry, I kind of maybe butchered that intro. <laughs> no, it's all good. A little bit. Um, so Sean is the executive director of advocacy, like I said. Uh, could you describe the position? It seems to be um, something that doesn't get as much PR as the others. Yeah, you sure. Um, so I kind of kind of group uh, the role in kind of three different areas. The first one's like making sure that students are being treated fairly by like the university or their or whatever and making sure that they're having the best possible experience here at MUN. Um, as well as making sure that they're being represented fairly, like students as a whole, they're being represented, whether it's on Senate committees, like you brought up, or in other bodies. And the third one is making sure that our general concerns are being heard by the university administration as well. Cool. Um, so for next year, what uh, when you're Executive Director of Advocacy come May 1st, what, uh, what are some of your biggest initiatives or goals, I guess? What might you want to emphasize? And, you could, and you could touch on the campaigns that... I yeah, mean, sure. Yeah. So um, it, there's actually s some really interesting work just getting started now on mental health issues on campus. There's going to be a panel. It was supposed to be this week, but because of the snowstorm, it got moved. Uh, so it's happening 
I believe it's Tuesday, I'm pretty sure. Um, so I'm super excited to build on the work that's going to start there. I think that it's definitely becoming a growing concern here on campus, and it's definitely impacting students both inside and outside the classroom as well. Um, the other thing is when I was going around getting my, my nomination signatures, a lot of students didn't know what the Director of Advocacy did, which I also find incredibly concerning, because if they don't know that I'm here, it's really hard for me to reach out and be able to help them. Definitely. So I guess making sure over the next year that like this role does gain like a higher profile and people are more aware of the fact that like it does exist as well as making sure that the reps we send out to sit on senate committees or whatever committees in the university to make sure that they're good student reps so i'm planning on doing a little bit of like hands-on like training with all of them a, kind of like a boot camp <laughs> and nice. before and so before we get into we're going to talk about the university structure and kind of talk about what sean means when he talks about representation and stuff like that but before that uh would you be just want to talk to us about the transition period, maybe what you've learned from the current executive and what you want to uh, kind of embody as you go forward with the position? Sure thing. Um, I guess with working with Ashley this year and then Candace the year previous when she was in the position, I've learned that it's it's not an easy position whatsoever. Um, you're often put in a lot of difficult situations where students are like might end up getting kicked out of school, getting kicked out of their house, or not really knowing where to turn. Um, and I also learned that the university is pretty complex when it turn, when it comes to trying to figure out where to go when you have a problem. So I guess um, using that experience that I've had working with them over the last two years, I'll be able to move forward and make sure that students are being helped as much as possible. And I know I've also learned who are the right people to ask the right questions to, to make sure that students are being helped. Yeah, so let's talk about those complexities a little bit. Yeah, right. yeah so um, I, don't, I don't know you, what is, I don't know, I'm not 100% <laughs> sure what this question even means. The complexities of the student structure. I think what we're talking about is, um, the channels and stuff like that. Like when I came, when I first came to Mun, I didn't realize mm -hmm. uh, how the university operated and it operates under this kind of uh, committee structure, right? Yeah. Uh, so could you maybe explain a little bit uh, briefly if you were talking sure. about old me who has no idea yeah. about how these things get processed? So I'm gonna try and not be um, boring, but it's very like structural. And um, so what happens is the university is basically administration is divided in two. So there's the board of regents. They decide like financial stuff and like administrative things like new buildings or passing budgets. And there's also Senate, and they decide more of the academic issues. The problem is that often those things kind of overlap. So sometimes you'll have the Board of Regents being responsible for something as well as Senate. Mm -hmm. And then Senate also and Board of Regents, they're both broken down into like further committee structures um, in between that. So as you can see, like already having that kind of setup, it makes navigating those systems super tricky. So it's super important that we as our student representatives like understand how it works so we can help students along the right path. Yeah, and maybe just qu if you don't mind giving yeah. us a couple examples of, because you talked about Senate and Board of Regents, which are pretty high profile committees, and there's yeah. also kind of some secondary committees, right? Like I sat on uh, education technology. Yeah, so for sure. So um, the Senate, Senate itself has established a number of like stand uh, standing committees to address like certain issues. So like I sat on one on course evaluation. So all we do, we meet every so often, and we talk about the CEQs and other means of course evaluation at the university. Yeah, like you said, Max, you sat on educational technology. So you're looking at how can the university better use educational technology to help improve its academic programs. And there's spots reserved for students on all these committees Yeah, as for well, sure. Right? Um, so thanks to the students who came before us, we've been guaranteed at least one seat on nearly the entirety of all of the committees at the university. So that's been really great, and it makes sure that like, our voice is being heard. So um, who who is it that sits on these committees? Because the, um, I mean, Munsu is obviously, the board is all students, but uh, the Senate and the Board of Regents is kind of like a mix of, of students, staff, faculty. Yeah. So who, what kind of is like the breakdown of the members of these committees? Sure, yeah, so we have, um, all the students' unions have a representative at the Board of Regents, so we have one. Um, they're appointed for a two-year term, so it's Candace right now. Right. Um, so that's done. But for Senate, it's actually super cool. It's open up to the entire student body. There's an application process in the fall. So when you're like, walking around in the fall, you'll see these posters up. And all you do is you pass in your resume, why you want to do it in your class schedule. You pass that in, and then the, we'll all gather some folks together, and we'll sit through, and we'll, try, we'll interview people and try and figure out who the best candidates are to represent students. Um, for the other committees, it's usually board members just because I already have a relationship with them, so it makes reporting back Definitely. Um, super easy, and it's easier for me to, I guess, tell a board member, like, you need to make sure you go to committee meetings than a student who I don't necessarily already have that connection with. Yeah, and so are there, if a, if a student wasn't able or didn't have the time or whatever to fulfill one of these kind of, uh, one of these roles as like the student representative, is there a different degree that students can participate in this process, like maybe more indirectly? 
Yeah, for sure. Well, I mean, um, my goal is to actually have a list like with me of who sits on what committee. So if a student has a particular concern, I can tell them like, look, if you want to talk about this with the person who's going to be representing you, here is the person. So you should go talk to them. Mm -hmm. um, so using that kind of approach. So like letting the student reps also be open to like the student body as a whole and making that process a bit more transparent. Yeah, it, and it's wild. Just my experience uh, subbing in on the Senate, mm -hmm. I had the opportunity to speak to the student code of conduct. Yeah, like, an, and I had the. I was basically in a position where if I if I wanted to, now I didn't. I could have put my hand up and commented on the student code of conduct. And I personally have had some run-ins with the student code of conduct, <laughs> particularly when I was living in residence. Yeah, so it was it was unbelievable, almost surreal that I found myself in a position where I could articulate the interests. Uh, I, I could personally or the interest that I've heard from other people. So, I mean, it's kind of, and it, it really kind of contextualized what Munsu does as well, too, when you realize that connection they have with, with the administration. Um, so, I guess next we'll talk about uh, there's an advocacy committee, right? The specific. Yeah, so maybe looking back what, into Munsu. Yeah, back into Munsu. What, uh, when you're on your, we were talking about those committees, but on the, your, you know, your kind of your baby committee, mm -hmm. what, uh, what are some of your goals for next year with the advocacy committee? Um, I guess the biggest one is to have them kind of be like, have their ears open for problems that they're hearing from students and bring them back. I found that from the advocacy committee this year, that's when we were most effective, when we'd bring back things that we've heard from either our faculties or our constituencies that we could bring back and be like, hey, like students in business are having a problem with this and students in education are having a problem with this. And oftentimes you'll find that problems are overlapping, but because they're in separate faculties, that like people might not be aware of the fact that those issues exist in both. Right. Um, the other thing is making sure that we have good student representation, um, and that people like people are generally happy with the directions that we're pushing when it comes to talking to the administration. And it seems sometimes our union takes on campaigns that kind of spin off of these potential uh, exactly for sure advocacy issues and stuff like that. Yep. Uh, so you, we talked a little bit about um, the committees. Do you have? Any goals set for yourself? Uh, you talked about um, creating like a, a line of communication between university reps and their student body and stuff like that. Do you have mm -hmm. any other goals like that that you are, are trying to kind of institutionalize throughout your year? Um, yeah, for sure. I like. I want to make sure. Ba my biggest thing is like honestly is making sure that people know that the director of advocacy is there and that the mm -hmm. students union is there to help them. I think if I can even make some progress towards that. Um, and I think part of it is going to have to be me leaving the office and holding like office hours in other locations other than my actual physical office in like in the UC because we like we represent students at the Center for Nursing Studies or over at Health Sciences or students that are on work terms. So I'm going to have to be, I guess, I, I think I'm going to have to be more, a bit more flexible and making sure that students that I'm approachable to students. Yeah, really available. True. Yeah. So um, I guess now we've got only like a couple minutes left before yep. we gotta finish off with Ryan. So with Sean, oh, finish off. Finish, okay, sorry, <laughs> finish the show off with Ryan is what I mean. Um, so now, radio listeners, uh, it's What's up? this question would probably have been <laughs> at least a bit better suited for Robert, but I mean, advocacy, student advocacy works with it too. Uh, but the budget hadn't come out when we had him on the show so provincial budget mm -hmm. uh big win for the whole education is a right um movement student movement in general so i mean you're obviously involved so what do you can you kind of talk about that big win for the movement yeah so it's definitely a massive win um i think that one i know for me came a little bit unexpected i wasn't really expecting it to be in this budget at no. all so what for anyone that doesn't know which is probably a few of you um Basically, what, what's been happened is that the provincial student loan system is actually being entirely replaced with an upfront needs-based grant. So what that means is that when you get a student loan now, there's a federal portion and there's a provincial portion. So that provincial portion is going to become a non-repayable grant, so you will never actually have to pay back the money um, that you're given from that provincial portion. It's given to you. So it's been a long battle for sure, and it's taken a good few years of work, but I was super glad to see it happen. Yeah, no, it's excellent. Yeah, and it's something that we've advocated for at a local level and is being yeah. advocated for all across the country. And it's so. been super cool because we saw the day after the next announcement, Nova Scotia came out with another announcement about their student loan program. Yeah, uh, yeah. Well, so I, I've no seen it's been making loan. waves all across the country, which I think is super impressive. So if you could just kind of, I mean... I don't want to say speculate, but look into the future a little bit. Where do you see the campaign going and how do we continue to articulate the interests of the students and apply pressure and stuff like that? Yeah, so I think that it's really important that despite the fact that, yes, we cool, we have 
um, upfront needs-based grants for the provincial portion. That still doesn't exist at the federal level, and I think that's something that we should start pushing more as well. The other thing is that the tuition freeze is never actually a guarantee for more than a couple years. So we need to make sure that like fees are frozen, and then we also look at progressively reducing tuition fees as well and making sure that our system of post-secondary education becomes the most accessible as possible. And uh, that being said, uh, there's probably a lot of kind of thanks to all the players who kind of got this going. So is I tried to do it last episode, actually. Mm -hmm. I tried to do this big thanks to like all these people. So like if there was a group of people, like if we were going to celebrate this victory, who would we want to celebrate it with? Like who are the who are the big players? I really think that it's been a victory of I would say nearly every single student that's been in edu the education, post-secondary education system in Newfoundland and Labrador over the last um, number of years because they were the ones that listened to us and signed the petition, that sent the emails, that sent the postcards, um, as well as obviously the people that helped organize those campaigns. And I think that we, it's like a huge pat on the back for everyone all around for what happened. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's and there's great. A, there's actually a little event happening tomorrow, isn't there? Do there you want to is. do a little shameless plug for that? Yeah, there's an event happening tomorrow in the UC. I think it's quarter to one or twelve thirty. Mm. Um, quarter to one. One p.m. Sorry, in the UC. Yeah, we're gonna have a party to celebrate the fact that um, provincial student loans are no more, and that grants are the new way to go. I heard it's a it might be a pizza party. I heard this yeah. pizza too, oh, and I heard pizza. this candy. Pizza party. Sweet. Okay, so that's where we're gonna probably cut you off now sorry to cut you short Sean no, it's totally uh, fine. so we're gonna move into Ryan so we're gonna do a little bit of uh, rustling around here to situate Ryan but uh, is there anything you'd like to say before you get That's off the kind air? of the last word yeah sure so if anyone ever has any problem with a professor with a course with an instructor with an RA with an RC with anyone I'm here to help you so please drop by and see me I'm in UC 2000 I start May 1st Ashley Wilson's there now to help you out until then so yeah that's basically it awesome thanks a lot Sean. Sean. thanks a lot Sean that's great I just uh, have a little waiting for Ryan to get to the chair. There's no advertising spot. Is there? No. <laughs> yeah, we didn't. We didn't get the pro. No, <laughs> they just. Fun. No, we don't do that. So we're here with Ryan. Uh, Ryan is our new executive director, incoming executive director. Ryan Murphy of External Affairs, Research and Communications. Uh, he's been around for a long time as a, bri a byproduct of his confusing and irrational Bachelor of Science, Psychology, Computer Science degree. He's held two previous executive positions and the highlight of his work as the director of student life was organizing what the Muse called the most, some of the most successful concerts in Munsu history. Congratulations, Ryan. Uh, while his achievements as executive director of campaigns included launching the Unlearn campaign and creating the Impact Award, which is a funding uh, opportunity that Kim's kind of mentioned a little bit earlier. He's also been a director at large, part-time students rep and science representative, mm. uh, and he looks forward to using his experience to enable his fellow executives facilitate an action-oriented board. I like that. That's, That's really right. good, Ryan. Thank you for coming on. Thanks, yeah, thanks Ryan. Um, so we kind of stole the show there for a second. So could you maybe describe the, your role that you're taking on in your, kind of your own terms? Sure. I see uh, three pretty big, I guess, pieces of it. Um, the first and, and arguably the most important is the member engagement component. So the Director of External Affairs is kind of the most, uh, the person, the executive most responsible for making sure that Munsu is accessible and open to membership, um, to making sure that people have the opportunity to engage in board decision making, to um, bring feedback to the board. Um, and so that's the, that's the first piece. And I think we're going to talk about that a lot more later. So I'll focus on the other two for now. Cool. Um, the second piece is, is public engagement. And so it's actually that the director of external affairs is the person who's the bridge between um, the students union and the public. So all external organizations, um, and that includes the government. Um, and so to me, it's a very important part of that role to make sure that we're building partnerships and, and trying to find ways to collaborate with outside organizations. Um, and for example, I can see a really powerful opportunity um, in working with the director of campaigns um, and making sure that we're connecting to external organizations who are working on the same campaigns that we are, because um, we don't always get, get outside of our little world. Um, and then the third is, is something that's actually um, come from the Director of External Affairs um, in history, um, because there used to be a very different structure about 10 years ago. Um, there used to be a presidential structure, and the Director of External Affairs inherited a lot of the responsibilities from that president. Definitely. Um, and what that means to me is that um, it's kind of the responsibility of the Director of External Affairs to enable the other executive and the board. Um, and I look forward to using a lot of uh, the leadership development experience that I've got. And of um, I've been thinking for a long time, the, the psychology side of my degree is about um, 
or uh, I was really interested in organizational industrial psychology, which is the focus on how to make an organization work really well, right? Mm -hmm. Or like how to make people work better and be more productive. And I look forward to using those sorts of ideas um, and also to using a lot of what I've learned about through leadership development programs here at MUN um, to make sure that the executive and the board are working at their fullest capacity. Um, so those are the things that I'm particularly excited about. There's a lot more to these roles, and, and so uh, I'll leave it at that for now. Cool. Well, yeah, like you said, uh, you've got a lot of experience uh, mm -hmm. with Munsu. What, uh, what is it that makes you stick around? I mean, you've been on the board. My first year in university was your first year on the board. Max was still kicking it back in Bedford when you started on the board. So, I mean, I feel like I'd probably go crazy, and I haven't even been on the board once. Mm -hmm. So what... Uh, what is it that keeps you coming back for more year after year? Hmm. They call me Grandpa Munsu if you didn't know. Um, <laughs> so there is that. I do get my fair share of mockery for being around for this long. Um, the thing that makes me stay around so much is, and it's cliche, but it's that I'm kind of repaying debts, right? Um, well, I was actually never supposed to be a MUN student. Um, I was supposed to go to the College of the North Atlantic, and when I first enrolled in, in MUN um, seven years ago, uh, I was on a waiting list to become an instrumentation technologist at the CNA. Um, and so the first year I was here, I was kind of just wasting time. Literally, I was waiting. Um, but at the end of that year, I said goodbye to a bunch of friends that I'd made, and I, uh, and I literally like said goodbye, I'm never going to see you again. And then I thought about it over the summer, and I was like, this is really the place for me. Um, and I decided to stay, and I still had no idea what I was doing for quite a while. Um, but interestingly, the, the opportunities that I had along the way while I was just kind of floundering are really what made me who I am. Um, and to that end, the Students' Union is really responsible for making a lot of those opportunities happen. Um, and that doesn't only mean the responsibilities that I've had with the board, but also with um, a variety of student groups. Um, and so to me, like, I need to make sure that I'm helping make the board happen because, or while I'm here, because the board made me happen in a way. So one thing you were talking about, um, you were kind of talking about how you're incorporating your degree into a little bit, like your psychology and even computer yeah. science stuff. So we like to talk to you kind of about the nature of communications in 2014 and how you feel like maybe the role needs to adapt a little bit. And you can maybe talk about any um, cool new uh, apps or aids that might help you with communications this sure. year. Deal. The first thing that I want to say on that is that um, digital technology is often looked at as like this sort of key solution, and it's definitely not a replacement for for being in person. Um, so I look forward to doing to using two different things that I um, I'm passionate about. One is called social design, where it's the idea that like there are really deliberate ways you can organize how people get together and how people work together, um, and I guess that's the psychology side. And I look forward to using that um, to making sure that we are getting out there in very real, very powerful ways and talking to members. Um, and um, in making sure that members have a chance to shape policy and to, to shape the decisions that we're making um, and to help us do our work. Um, but then, as you said, technology is, is a, a fun thing these days. Uh, and so I really do sound like a grandpa. Um, yeah. <laughs> but I shouldn't because I'm a big geek. Um, there's a lot of different w places that we can go as a student union trying to use what's out there right now um, to make sure that members are have as much access as is possible as is humanly possible with the students union um, and so that means that uh, we have a website that's getting updated daily it means that we're um, in my mind I look forward to writing a lot and to writing blog posts about recent decisions that we've made um, or to ask questions about the student body and hopefully get some responses back um, I also look forward to using um, different tools like forums, I think, um, but not the traditional forum. Um, and I don't want to get into details because we're still shaping it, but um, the, there's plenty of tools out there that will allow us to simply open up to the members and to say, like, hey, if you want to bring up a topic with us and ask not only the board, but also any other members of the Students' Union if this is important or what we can do about it, um, there are tools out there that allow us to do that um, and do it in a very easy way. And to me, that's what it's all about. It's, making, it's shaping the culture. It's making it really easy for people to, to jump in. Um, and that means having a big button on the Munsu website that says, like, get involved. And you click that button, and you can already see all the different ways in which you can contribute to a conversation or to ask questions yourself. Yeah, and now, so we talked a little bit about the kind of general communications and stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, in, internally, I know that we, I think on Wednesday uh, evening, mm -hmm. The executive here hosted a, a kind of a meet and greet for the incoming. Right. And one thing that uh, was a kind of a problem for me when I was on the board was I was never here in the summer to participate. Mm -hmm. So could you maybe use uh, the summer as an example as to how we might um, 
use our communication tools available to us now as, and kind of how we can develop the board? Yeah. Um, so the the forum thing that I just talked about is one of the things that I hope to do. Um, and by hosting that meet and greet, um, which is the first time that I've seen something like that happen with the board, um, we already like kind of put faces to names. Um, and we had a really great showing, 30, 32 ish, 31 or 32 people showed up for cool. that meet and greet, um, which rarely happens before September for the board, which means that the board usually u loses four months of development and of, of um, um, of thinking together. Um, and so I hope to use the online tools that I've talked about for um, over the summer to have a place where the board can get together and bring up ideas and, and meet, even if you are out of the province. Um, and at the same time, like I said, to have a lot of in-person things too that are very deliberately designed um, so that they are very functional, very productive. Um, and uh, one thing that I've thought about a lot is that we spend a lot of time sort of circling and uh, and thinking about problems, but not necessarily getting to solutions. And so that action-oriented um, board that I'd, I'd like to see um, is something that would come from um, changing the way that we meet and discuss. And I, I can't talk um, except loftily about that yet. But OK, no, that's cool. That's cool. Um, so. I just want to say, when you were talking about the website and everything, uh, I mean, I think, I think you know your shit. I think that you're the good guy to take that over because the website's been getting delayed and stuff. But now, one thing I want to ask about, um, where you guys got acclaimed, I just sort of want to ask. I'm not going to say anything about a vote of confidence. I know the problems with vote of confidence, but I think that the amount of acclamations that we see is uh, evidence of voter apathy and student apathy towards Munsu in general. So I guess I just want to say. Uh, when you're external director of communications, what is it that you, how, how do you think that you should, or we should, Munsu should, uh, communicate better to kind of end this apathy mm. amongst the student body? Mm. I'm going to pivot back to, to that idea of social design, to that idea of, of the culture. Um, apathy to me is pretty interesting because, um, and I mentioned this to, I think, laughter at the, the debate um, when, during the election, but um, the last time the voter the last time that voter turnout peaked, it's because a lot of scandal was happening. Um, and so voter apathy to me um, means a lot of different things. Um, and I think that uh, it's about making sure that there are issues that are very relevant to every student out there that, that drives that voter turnout up. And that, more importantly to acclamations, drives up people getting involved. Um, and so it's a matter of culture. It's a matter of uh, those social design pieces that I talked about already of bringing meetings to the members, of making sure that members have a chance to get involved well before an election comes around. Um, and one, one really silly thing is that we usually could know the date of an election a long time before the date the election is actually supposed to take place. Definitely. Um, when for some reason, we always like that priority always falls off the radar until like, oh, gee, we need to set a, an election date. But we really should be getting better at setting that date well ahead of time and advertising it well ahead of time, and then providing a lot of opportunities for those people who think, gee, I might want to get on the board to come out and see what it's really all about to make sure that it's really for them. Because I bet there's a lot of people who see the posters too late or to see who see the posters and wonder what it's really like, but don't have a chance to figure it out before they can run. Um, and so fixing those little problems that are really easy to fix is, I think, the, the low-hanging fruit that would make um, voter turnout uh, go up and um, to really create some competitions for the positions that are on the board. Wicked. Wicked. Good ideas. Mm. Sure. And I'm, I appreciate you sharing that kind of stuff with us. And because, uh, um, yeah, it's, it's kind of at least public opinion, talked about a lot in public opinion. Uh, but we're just going to move maybe to something a little more open-ended. Uh, Ryan, you, we've... Uh, Ryan, you're involved, if I'm not mistaken, in a lot of leadership development stuff, and I think you have like a, a really kind of sincere, uh, authentic passion for um, just uh, just learning and developing thoughts and stuff. And Ryan also had a, a, a TED talk on YouTube. Maybe I'll make a little quick plug for that. Ryan Murphy on YouTube. Uh, he talked about. Um, what you're going to do when you grow up, mm, essentially. Not what you do, but um, who you're going to be when you grow up. Who you're actually, be. That's actually right. the key part of the TED Talk. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. great. great. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, what is it? Not what you're going to be, who you're going to be. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that shit's dope. So, yeah. maybe, Ryan, if you don't mind, maybe sharing a, a story with us or something maybe thought provoking or something that you maybe even developing yourself. Because, I mean, you also write for the news and stuff. Ryan's mm. constantly getting producing content here. So, sure. Um, so, to me, especially if you're a younger student, because older students tend to have a little bit more figured out, but um, it, it was about saying yes to everything. That first year where I floundered, I didn't really do anything um, with, I didn't really do anything in university. I didn't really 
do my class, go to classes or do homework or, or anything. I was just floundering because I was waiting. And then that second year, I realized that there was a lot of opportunities for me to learn about myself in going out and getting involved. Um, and that's super cliche, but literally to go out there and to say yes to everything. And then to think a lot about um, what those opportunities, what those experiences mean to you, um, what parts of them you liked, what parts of them you didn't. Because that's how you like you, you expand, you look for a diverse set of opportunities, then you pick out what you really like, and then you kind of narrow down and you go into those more specific areas, but then you should fan out again. Um, so I'm not, probably not making any sense, but the, the point is that um, <laughs> personal development, university is all about personal development for me, and that personal development is all about looking at a lot of opportunities for yourself, diving into whatever you love and then spreading out again and then that process of spreading out and of getting specific is really how you find your niche in life um, and that's kind of what I've done um, and it worked for me uh, although not and everybody. if you don't mind me commenting yeah. on that I mean we, we we're very Munsu centric and we talk about uh, Munsu and the nature of it all mm -hmm. but one thing that I recognize with all three of the people in the room with us and the other um, executives is that there's a grounding in clubs and societies and there's a grounding in uh, just to be involved with your students' union doesn't necessarily mean being involved with your board or Absolutely. board committees. I mean, it's being involved and in, and in, uh, like involved with the little sex and the and the little uh, the little uh, m kind of micro organizations within it. So, um, I think one thing that would make Munsu less daunting for people is to realize that you don't necessarily go from zero to Munsu. You kind of there's a there's a big process there, and a number of different degrees to get involved with. Yeah. So I guess now we're. Uh we're running out of time, so I guess we're going to ask this big, sort of our big picture question that we like to ask. We asked Robert and Devin a few weeks ago, but we didn't want to crowd it all up in here tonight with the same question three times. So if you could, uh, if you could say one thing, Ryan, and you knew that it all 13,000 or however many it is nowadays, uh, Munsu members were going to hear what you had to say, what would you say? Hmm. I'm going to cheat. I'm going to say two things. Um, because Matt has just mentioned it, to get involved in club societies and resource centers or to create your own if something's not out there. Um, because that is really how you learn who you are as much as it is um, you giving back or you um, meeting other people. Um, and so getting involved in the clubs and societies and resource centers that are out there um, is, is key to having a really powerful university experience. Um, and then the real thing that I would say that the message that I thought about um, when I was reflecting on this question is for you to see problems and, and solve them. Um, I think that everybody kind of walks through the day and like everybody complains a lot. I know that that's one kind of <laughs> universal truth about people. Um, and every time you complain, you're probably talking about a problem that can be solved somehow, right? Um, and there are ways to solve every single problem. Um, and I know that sometimes that doesn't sound realistic because there's a lot of really complex problems out there, um, but there's something to do. Th there's something to do about everything. And so, when you see those problems, if you can't immediately come up with a solution, come talk to us because that's what we're here for. Um, and uh, I think we can help you um, figure out how to fix that and how to make how to make whatever you're thinking about work better. Cool. Thank well, you very much. Thanks Ryan. a lot for coming on the show, Ryan and Kim and Sean. Mm -hmm. uh, so this will be up. Well, if I was going to say for anyone who missed it, it'll be up on YouTube, but that doesn't matter to anyone who's listening right <laughs> now. But uh, you can follow us on Facebook and Twitter, Wrestling Pages, YouTube, Max and Chris. Uh, tune in next Thursday at 11, and uh, it'll, it'll be awesome. Yeah, yeah, thanks again, <laughs> and make sure to look into your union. These are a bunch of uh, available, approachable people uh, who are dying to... Uh, Listen to what you have to think er, and say and stuff like that. So uh, get involved with your union. And Chris, you're beautiful, my favorite Thank co host. You. Uh, was, thanks yeah, for coming in, you you're guys. You're my favorite and only co host as well. <laughs> so uh, have a good night, everybody. Thank you. This is 93.5 CHMR FM.